Hello, everyone. We're so glad to have you. It's another Friday. And so I am your hostess, Cindy McDonald, for the Friday Forums. I've been doing these since COVID started as a way to help us all understand, come together, and just navigate the whole chaos of COVID. And now that we're celebrating a year this week, I'm really nostalgic because a year ago during this week, I was actually coming back from the UK, having visited all these wonderful colleges through the help of our guest speakers, through Jenna Hartzell. She set them all our tours up and we were able to go visit colleges. And I did this with my colleague, Sandy Firth. So we're very excited to have you here today. As you're logging in, tradish, um, what we normally do is I want to have you use the chat and tell us where you're from so Jenna can see where you're located. So go in, make sure you turn the, the setting from panelists only to panelists and attendees, and then everybody can see where you're from. So as you're joining us today, we're so glad to have you. And we're, I know you're very excited. I've been watching the registrations go up, up, up this week as we're going to talk about studying the UK and why would we wouldn't have our students. So Jenna, can you see we've got people from yeah. Brazil, Bay Area, Malibu, Brazil, Marcia's from Brazil. Um, we often have a consultant, Diana, from Colombia. Um, you know, just let Jenna know every place that you're from. Yeah, it's great to see where everyone's joining from. And I see some familiar names in the chat too of people who have joined on the tours um, in the past few years. So it's really great. Um, thank you, Cindy, so much for having me here today. And um, it's really exciting to be here to talk about studying in the UK. I'm so glad to have you too, Jenna. And you are the education manager for the British Council. So can you tell us how did you get into that position? Yeah. Or how, how did that come about for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'll try to make it the, the bridge version, but I became interested in this world of international education from my own study abroad experiences like I think happens for a lot of people. So when I was an undergraduate at UCLA, I did a one month study abroad, I'm um, a Shakespeare in England, one month study abroad experience. And then I also did a semester abroad in Granada, Spain. And those experiences meant so much to me. I thought it was incredible that as an undergraduate, um, you could take advantage of these options, but a lot of my peers um, did not take advantage of those options for a variety of reasons. And so I thought, uh, you know, I want to dedicate my life to making sure other people know about these opportunities. Um, and so I did after university, I went and taught abroad for a year in Spain. And when I came back, I thought, you know, I think I want to work as a study abroad advisor in a university and talk to a few study abroad advisors um, in my area who strongly recommended I go and get a master's in international education. So um, long story short, I ended up in Washington DC at the George Washington University doing my master's and uh, an alum of the program was working at the British Council in their education um, department and he came and talked to our class and I thought, wow, this is amazing um, to work like in an intersection of cultural relations, international education, work with so many different stakeholders about um, promoting information about this opportunity. So um, when I graduated, they had an opening and I applied and that's how I ended up here today. <laughs> um, so I've been with the British Council now for about, um, about six years, um, working on their education um, services team. And for those who aren't familiar with the British Council, it's the UK's organization for uh, cultural exchange, educational um, opportunities. And we have staff that work on programs ranging from uh, the arts to civil society projects, English language learning, um, and there are offices in over a hundred countries in the world. So um, I'm based in our US offices in Washington, DC. Um, and yeah, it's been an incredible opportunity for me to learn about um, 
the benefits of a UK education, which I think if I had known more about when I was looking at universities might have considered. And I think that's where we're at as advisors is, you know, having that understanding and, you know, education here in the U.S. or in other systems too, you know, Canada or other places has changed and, and particularly the cost of education has changed. So what are some reasons that you can give that students should consider um, when they're looking at should they study in the UK? Why, why do students come as international students to study in the UK? What are some of the benefits? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a wide variety of reasons that I found students choose to go to the UK um, with talking with different students, but I think a common thread that we find is, um, you know, the, the first um, is the the style of the courses in the UK and the UK style of teaching might appeal to some students. So we know the style of courses and style of teaching aren't for every student. Um, but for example, for those students who know what they want to study and don't want to um, spend time in university studying um, general education courses in the UK, typically students we'll start right away studying um, modules or classes that are all related to their subject that they've chosen. So that can be a real benefit for students who know exactly what they want to study. Um, and I don't, when I mention that, I don't want people to think there's no flexibility in a UK education. For example, in Scotland, students for the first two years can study up to two additional subjects to the course that they select, and then they'll finalize um, their course or their major in their final two years. So there are there is room for flexibility, but in general, if students want to get straight into studying their course, um, that can be a great benefit to studying in the UK. And the style of teaching really um, prepares students to be, uh, you know, independently researching. Um, independently learning and also being able to come to class and be able to defend a position. Um, a lot of these skills that students, if they want to go into further study, for example, and get a master's will really benefit them. Um, so there's less um, continuous assessment. They might have you know, one or two larger assessments uh, for their courses. And typically students will do one large capstone project um, or thesis at the end of their course, um, which involves, again, a lot of that independent research. So for, I think, students interested in developing those types of skills and are ready for that type of um, learning style, which, again, like I said, I don't think is for everyone necessarily, but for those students who feel like they're prepared for that and they want the type of course um, where they don't have to study gen eds, um, that's one big attraction. I'd say the other, Cindy, is what you already mentioned, which is um, value for money, which we know is a big um, topic of conversation in higher education right now. And um, I think it, it depends on where a student is looking in the U.S., but if they are looking to go to a private university or out of state, um, and they're not going to have like major scholarships at those universities, um, then... Um, then I do think that um, going to the UK economically can be a more economical option. Um, and in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, undergraduate courses are three years long versus four years. So students can take that cost savings into account as well. Um, and I guess not to go too long on this question, but um, finally, I just think that opportunity to be in a global learning environment is really attractive to a lot of students. So UK universities have some of the most global undergraduate student bodies in the world. Um, their undergraduate student bodies tend to be made up of about 20% international students on average, and the faculty mirrors that percentage at most universities. So Oh, thank you. And someone's mentioning, yes, and at the master's level, one-year masters are very common. So again, that if students are looking for cost savings. Um, and yeah, just that the UK has so much rich um, you know, history. They have 
so many options for students from like bustling cities to quieter campuses. And then they're really close to um, other countries that students can explore along with exploring the four nations within the UK. So I think students sometimes, um, I mean, I certainly didn't as a high school student really understand that the UK was made up of like England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. And those all um, have very distinct, you know, cultures that, you know, students get to explore while they're there. So um, those are some of the reasons that we hear students choose to go to the UK. And I think those are all very good points because they're things that we often don't think about. And we're seeing a lot of chat and some questions too. Um, you know, we as advisors um, have had, some of us have had that experience and, and can, you know, benefit from that and share that with others. But as I mentioned previously, many students and parents are very surprised that they can get a student loan to go to a UK school, oh, just yes. like they yeah. can get one here, right? And, and when you look at three years, you're not having to, um, you know, there's nothing, I don't want to imply that there's something wrong with general ed. A lot of people need that. Yeah. There's a question on that. So we'll come back to that. But it, sometimes you do have students who are like, I know exactly what I want to do. I know what I want to study. Um, and to be able to go and get right into that, um, that's a great benefit of being able to, as you said, not have to do the gen ed, do it in three years instead of four. That can save a lot of time and money. And then the global um, exposure is huge. And so that can make a big difference. So, um, so those are some of the benefits. What has, um, how has COVID impacted some of these things? And we'll come back to some of these other questions. I see Allison has a question about, you know, the cost differential and, and there's a couple of questions on that, but, but how has how has COVID affected all of this? Yeah, so, I mean, we know, yeah, COVID has affected all of us. It's, you know, drastically impacted um, US universities and also UK institutions. So I think, um, you know, in the UK, in terms of, students at university currently, in general, UK universities did open this fall for bl mostly blended learning models. Um, they then did have to go into a period of tighter restrictions around Christmas time and after um, where it was virtual learning only. And then now um, each, each nation within the UK is um, opening up in a little bit different way, but in general, students who have a practical element to their course. So they need to be in a lab. Um, they like need to be in an art studio to complete their courses. Um, those students are being allowed back onto campus, um, but students who can take their courses virtually are being asked to continue to take those co courses virtually um, during the spring semester. Um, in terms of um, the application process, I think the biggest impact, which, you know, similar to what we've seen in the US is, you know, students not being able to access and take standardized testing um, for their college admissions. So this is something UK universities are very familiar with and they know um, the struggle that US students have had. And I think for the UK universities, it's difficult because I can't give like a blanket, you know, they've all gone, test optional or they all haven't, it really has been university by university. Um, but I would say the majority of universities that I talk to are, are saying that they will be flexible if a student does not have a standardized test score um, that the university would typically require, then they will look at alternative entry requirements. So for example, if a student has been taking honors classes or if they've been taking dual enrollment classes, they can look at those um, in lieu of the standardized tests. Um, and I will say this is kind of general to the UK that UK universities typically are looking for something additional to just the US high school diploma to be able to admit students. Um, it's because of the way that the qualifications agency in the UK has um, evaluated a US high school diploma. So they're typically looking for something additional, whether that's, um, you know, in typical years, it would have been, you know, like a SAT or AP scores or other types of standardized tests. But um, like I said, most universities are trying to be as flexible as they can um, I know some are still requiring those tests, which um, I know is, is 
making it a difficult situation for students. But, and I would say, I know this, you know, whenever I say this, I know this like requires a lot more time um, and um, getting in touch with the UK reps can be difficult to find those contacts. But I will say the UK representatives for each university within the international office are amazing resources. And if you reach out to them to ask about the entry requirements, they'll be able to tell you just, you know, straight what the requirements are, what alternatives they can work with. Um, and I'm always happy to put myself out there as like a connector if you, you know, need to get in touch with someone at a university um, or want to get in touch, I'm happy to um, make those connections. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, I guess other ways that COVID has impacted besides standardized testing is, um, I think, just some of maybe the kind of um, obvious impacts that, you know, UK reps haven't been able to come out to the US. So students haven't been able to get that in-person interaction with the university representative. Um, I guess on the flip side, um, it's been a positive thing, I think, to see the UK universities offering more virtual, um, either open days or webinars or taster lectures. So um, hopefully, you know, that's been a, a positive thing that's come out of the, that there's been more accessibility in terms of more people being able to access um, information. And I think we're going to see that continue. I, you know, and I was um, on a panel recently or heard a panel recently, and um, that's one of the benefits from coming from COVID, right, is that people have found that they can do things effectively. It doesn't necessarily replace the in-person, but it expands what offices and things are able to do. And, and I would definitely reiterate to everybody that you are in your office and the British Council is a great resource for reaching out to those international um, representatives that call, at the colleges themselves. Um, you know, that's how Sandy and I were able to come do the tour. I know there are many people on the webinar today that have done the British Council tours. So can you talk a little bit about what the tours are that the council has done in the past? And is there any talk about doing any of those in the future? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, there's um, many universities in the UK will offer um, their own version of familiarization tours. And I think starting around um, 2014 or 2015, the British Council started organizing um, an about annual tour um, to different regions in the UK, um, which, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to be able to go and like see the universities in person, um, get to talk to current students um, there and, and, and meet the staff there who will be looking after the students. But for now, um, we don't have any information on upcoming tours. My guess would be we won't be resuming those until 2022, which is crazy to say, but, um, but I would recommend and we can talk about resources and way to stay in touch at the end as well. But um, we do have a counselor email list, which if you sign up to that, um, and maybe I can find a way to share the details in the chat or share it with Cindy that um, we would share any updates about tours there. And we also share um, information from UK universities about their events, as well as um, any events that we're doing virtually for now. Great. Oh, that sounds great. And I think, yeah, so sharing the details in terms of how people can get on the mailing list, that'll be um, very helpful. We're getting, um, when we were talking about the cost, so some of the questions were on, well, what is the cost, the average undergraduate cost uh, for a student at a UK university, especially an international student, like coming from the US? And, you know, the, so what, what, are, what do those costs look like? Yeah, so tuition fees tend to run students um, between, it would be, I think it can go as low as, from what we see like in our averages, like 10,000 to 26,000 pounds a year. Um, so there's a range, you know, depending on the university, those would be just tuition fees. Um, for medical degrees, it would be um, higher. So I think closer to a little over 50,000 um, pounds per year tends to be a, a typical annual tuition for medical school um, or a, a course in medicine. 
Um, and then starting for undergraduate fees, those can range between 15 to 30,000 pounds a year. Um, and again, that would typically be a one-year course for, for a postgraduate um, master's degree. And then um, I just was double checking if UK visas and immigration had changed these numbers, but um, UK visas and immigration or UKVI, they typically, they have a monthly amount that, um, you know, they, they require for international students um, to have as a maintenance amount. US students are exempt from having to show proof of um, finances um, upon entry to the UK, but I think it's, you know, maybe a good guideline to use in terms of what students should expect in monthly um, like living costs. So those are um, 1,265 pounds per month of students are studying in London. And then outside of that, um, they recommend 1,015 pounds per month. Um, so th those are the costs that students are looking at. And like Cindy mentioned, most UK universities are on, on the lists of um, universities that can accept the FAFSA, so students can take their loans abroad. Um, I definitely, you know, always recommend a student does double check that with the university, not every single university in the UK does, but the majority do. Um, and then, um, and just to note though, that if students do have any federal grants, those unfortunately cannot be taken overseas. Um, those are only to be used at uh, domestic universities. So they can do the student loans, but they can't take a Pell Grant or exactly. uh, you know, a, a state grant or something like that. Exactly. Now, maybe private scholarships, they might be able to, you know, take Yeah, them. yeah so, and many, oh, sorry, Cindy. No, go ahead. Yeah, just that many, many UK universities also offer scholarships specifically for international students or maybe even specifically one for US students. So it's always worth inquiring with the university representatives what they have. And, and also just to mention some of the UK universities do also accept um, the GI Bill. Um, so that's another form of funding that um, US citizens can take abroad. That's a good point too. Yeah. So if you're working um, with veterans or um, you know military personnel and they're stationed in you know um, Europe or something, that then they can do that. Um, so let's uh, let's go to some of these other questions and, and let's go back to the financial question. Um, Rachel shared, and thank you, Rachel. And she, yeah. Rachel Coates, she's she's, a, <laughs> she's an expat expat from oh. England, and she said ten to twenty six um, k pounds equals roughly thirteen k to thirty two thousand dollars in U.S. dollars. So when you're looking at a private school here in the U.S., you know we're looking at eighty thousand. I you know per year for a private school. And you can go to a college in the UK for 13 to 32. I think that is a reason that a lot of people are looking um, at the system. So what has that, what is the pandemic? How has that changed application numbers um, through for the UK? So um, I think surprisingly to us, at least the um, application numbers have increased, um, we've had a dramatic increase in applications from the US, um, which is exciting for us to see um, working in this area. So in this past, the um, UCAS deadline that just passed, um, which is typically um, January 15th for most undergraduate courses, um, they extended the deadline this year to January 29th, um, but from that January 29th cycle, they saw a 60% increase in undergraduate applications from the US, which um, yeah, is incredible to see. So, and I would say that, I mean, that definitely is the highest jump in um, or increase that we've seen, but over the past several years, or since I've been with the British Council, we've seen a steady increase in US student um, applications and enrollments in the UK. So it does seem like interest is um, continuing to grow. That's significant. You know, that's that's yeah. a huge um, difference for, for the number and, yeah. and seeing the applications, then how that translates right. into enrollments will be the next measure, right? Yeah. So, um, so Gillian says, are student visas being issued for this fall? Um, so that I think, um, I think that's maybe 
still to be seen. And I do want to say I'm not, um, I'm not a visa expert. So this is something I would always, um, you know, double check, you know, the UKVI websites um, to make sure that you have like the most up-to-date information. But um, as far as I know, any new international students um, would be advised, you know, not to start the visa process until, you know, they're told by the university that they will be, um, you know, coming back to um, in-person classes. Um, and so what's happening right now for any international students who had started their courses and then now have to be learning virtually because of the pandemic, um, UKVI has made concessions in the visa process to make sure they won't be penalized for not being able to get to the UK um, in, in terms of their visa. So universities can continue to sponsor those students that have already started um, their courses. Um, and they just have to make sure those students intend to return to the UK when they can in person. Um, and so, yeah, for new international, any, any students, you know, applying or thinking of going in the fall, I would just recommend that they're in very, very close contact um, with their international office at their university um, so that they know when, you know, when they get the green light to go ahead and start the visa process, then, um, then that's all very clear for them. And that's an important factor too, is to not only for income, you know, new students, but for returning students, because so many had to come home and they're still here. And so being able to yeah. get those visas, yeah. um, you know, in the fall, and um, hopefully that will be, you know, yes. in the next few months, they'll be able to see that. I don't know, how long does it take to get a visa? Is it quite an extended amount of time? Um, so students can, they can start the process up to six months before. Um, I think the process tends to be more around, um, I think it's typically more around like three months um, before when students will start that process. Um, and yeah, it, it can, it can vary. I, I'll have to check with the UKVI. They sometimes have different like times that they guarantee like, oh, we'll have a visa to a student within this many weeks. But I'd say most students are typically starting that process um, three months before. Um, but what they'll get from their university is they have to wait until they get this certain type of number called a CAS number from their university to even be able to start that process. Um, so again, it's just super important they're in close contact with their institution and I just want to echo what you said, Cindy, that yes, we are hopeful. I think the whole UK university sector is very hopeful that they will be welcoming students back to um, in-person learning this fall. So that leads in, I see this question as in the chat um, as well, um, that what, how is the vaccination rolling out in the UK? Um, you know, is it on pace or do they feel like they're behind? Um, you know, is there any, do international students, Catherine asked, do they require COVID vaccination for international students? Mm -hmm. You know, are there some requirements or things that are connected to the vaccines or vaccination that have been expressed, you know, that, that the colleges have talked about or anything like that? Do you know, have you heard anything on that um, front? Jenna? Yes, and so, and yeah, I'm sure if anyone's joining us from the UK, they can probably give us the, the super up-to-date update, but yeah, from what I'm hearing from, um, you know, co-workers and any updates we get, they, they feel very um, confident and, uh, you know, they feel like they're on track with their vaccination in the UK. Um, I think right now, um, at least, you know, with the colleague what I talked to this morning, at least in their area, vaccines were being, um, you know, distributed sort of like how they are in the U.S. in terms of, you know, there's people within a certain age bracket that are getting their um, vaccinations. I think where he was, it was if you're 56 and older. Um, and then, of course, any essential workers and people with any um other types of um, conditions that would mean that they would um, need to get the vaccine earlier. Um, I see as a resident's comments about distribution is high. Yeah, that, that's what I've been hearing from um, colleagues. Okay. Um, and from what I've heard from universities, you know, international students in the UK will be able to access the vaccine. So 
it's not something that they will be barred access to. Um, and I do know um, that I, I believe for all four nations, although I would have to check this, um, they are requiring like a negative test for anyone traveling into the UK right now, but you know, those mm -hmm. travel requirements continue to change. So that is something I would always recommend um, double checking gov.uk website. Yeah, and that's the key is to check the website and make sure and find out where, you know, where everybody is. So Rosa has a question, international students with a visa, how long can they stay in the country after graduation? I know that, you know, this is an issue in the US, um, mm -hmm. it's an issue in Canada. Do they need a visa sponsor to be able to work in the UK? So once they get their degree, if, and I have a student who did exactly this, went to the UK, studied, loved it, did his master's degree and was actually working on becoming a, a, a he was in Scotland. So he was working oh. on getting his Scottish, you know, becoming a Scottish citizen. Oh, and wow. of course he had a Scottish oh. girlfriend, you know, oh, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. lots of reasons to stay there. So what, what yeah. are the rules for in the UK for that? Yeah, so I mean, this is an area where I feel like we have an exciting update to share um, that the UK has recently launched um, what they're calling the graduate route. Um, and this will apply for any students that have started their courses from this past fall, fall 2020 onwards. Um, and for students who study an undergraduate or a master's degree in the UK, they'll be eligible to apply for the graduate route at the finish, um, at the completion of their studies to stay in the UK to work or look for work for two years. Um, and it can be at any skill level. So there's no sort of like salary um, um, minimum um, to the grad staying in the UK with the graduate route. So I think that's a really exciting um, new opportunity for international students um, being able to stay in the UK and work for up to two years. And um, if, if there's anyone advising um, PhD um, uh, students, if students study a PhD in the UK, they can stay for up to three years via the graduate route. Um, so that's a really exciting um, development and UKVI is working to make concessions for, um, you know, typically for this type of route, you would need to be in the UK for your course to be eligible um, to apply. But um, for students who weren't able to start their course in the UK and have been having to learn virtually, um, they just, I think at the moment, they've set the date that they need to be back in the UK. Um, I think it's like a date in September um, for them to be able to qualify for the route and um, for master's students who started in this fall and will be finishing, they need to try to get back into the UK. I think they have a June date right now, but those do continue to shift as the pandemic continues to progress. So, um, but yeah, in general, uh, undergraduate master's students can stay up to two years and PhD students up to three. Oh, that's exciting. That's very yeah. exciting. Well, and this brings up another question, and then we're going to get to some of the questions on the Q&A. So if you have other questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And the reason I have you do that is because then if we don't have time to get them, then I can give Jenna your email address and she can answer your questions. So, so that's why using the um, Q&A is a little bit more advantageous than putting things in the chat. Um, but one of the questions comes up to um, is like, if I do my degree in, in the UK, um, is it going to be considered valid when I come back to my country, to the US or Canada or, you know, other, but, you know, particularly in the US. So, so that opportunity or, you know, how are those, those degrees viewed? Are they viewed as the same equivalent? Do you have to take testing? Um, and then, and then corresponding to that with the same thing for those graduate. So I go to the UK, I can study for three years, get my degree. I can go straight into medical school, as you said. And there's, there's, I mean, there's more to it than, than that. I, I know they're competitive and, you know, those kinds of things. That's another conversation, but, 
but you know, essentially I could get this uh, bachelor's and master's degree in the same four years it would take me to get a four-year degree in the US. And if you're a resident of California, like my students are, and they start at the community college, they'll spend three years at the community college and then spend another at least three years at the um, you know, four-year university that they transfer to. So they've got six years to get their degree and they can have a bachelor's and a master's in the same amount of time in the UK. So, but will it transfer? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a very important one um, for students considering going abroad. And um, I guess I'll start with um, any courses that, so I think it's important to make the distinction between any professional courses that would require um, state licensing, for example. Um, those, I think those maybe I'll address second, but in general, UK degrees are um, viewed are, they're, they're all viewed as valid in the U.S. for students returning um, for employment, for example, if they want to go on to a master's, um, they are looked at as valid degrees. And we did a study, um, I think it, it's now going on being a little while ago, I think a little over 10 years, but we did a um, survey from the British Council with a sampling of U.S. and Canadian employers. Um, and from that survey found that the majority, vast majority of employers considered a UK degree, undergraduate degree, degree to be equal to or even better than a US degree. Um, so it certainly has, I think, a very high reputation for a good quality degree. Um, but I will say, you know, for students, I saw someone in the chat saying maybe for like a specific STEM graduate program that a student, you know, is thinking about, would that be an issue? I do always, you know, for, for those types of programs that students might anticipate um, that they would have issues if it's like a very particular program, um, you know, it's always you know, it doesn't hurt. I always, you know, encourage them to be in touch with them, ask, you know, do you accept UK degrees um, at the undergraduate level to apply for a master's degree for this program? Um, and some employers and um, universities will ask students to get their degree evaluated by a qualification evaluation agency. Um, so I know there's there's many in the US, um, for example, like World Education Services is one that I know students will go to to evaluate their UK degrees. So that might be like an additional step that someone might be asked to do, um, but I have only heard about that. And it seems to me in my work, it's only come up in rare cases and majority um, of the time, students have no issue using their degrees here to get into grad school or for work. Um, on the sort of, I guess you'd say like professional degree side. So students are looking at um, like teaching, um, anything like in medical fields, um, you know, law or veterinary science, they all vary a lot. So that is something students um, would need to do additional research into. I know, um, for example, for teaching, I, I do think um, most UK reps would even encourage students, you know, to stay um, in the US uh, for teaching because of all the state licensing that's involved. Um, and that even moving state to state can be difficult um, for those types of jobs. But for example, with veterinary medicine, um, there's several programs in the UK that are accredited also by the American Veterinary Association. So that's an area where they could, you know, get their degree overseas and easily bring it back. Um, for law, it really varies state to state. So that's also something to check. But I know there's some states that allow international law graduates just to go straight to take the bar. I think that's um, like California and New York, for example, allow international graduate international graduates just to go ahead and take the bar without any additional tests or schooling. Um, and um, and the medical schools, I think that also really varies, but typically students would have to do additional, um, you know, schooling and tests once they come back to the U.S. But um, so, yeah, that is something that would definitely recommend that students really research and maybe even if they can ask the university, if they can talk to a U.S. student who's gone through that program and come back to hear about that process, um, I think could be really valuable. 
And Jeannie asked about social work, nursing, you mentioned education. Um, do you know anything like for nursing? You know, that is that I'm presuming they have to come back and take the exams like they yeah. would, you know, here in the US anyway. Yeah, so I will say I'm not as familiar with nursing, but my guess would be that it's similar to um, medical courses that they would need to come back and take additional um, schooling and tests. Um, but that's something I could definitely check um, for the person asking. And unfortunately, I'm not sure about social work, but that is something I could look into. What about architecture? Shelley asked about architecture. Yes, uh, I, I looked this up um, in the fall for school and now I can't remember the particulars, but I do think there was an additional exam that international graduates would have to take coming back um, typically. And I think that goes back to, and that's one of the things that we can do as advisors is, you know, help students understand and parents understand that and navigate that, that process of asking questions, getting clarification, you know, validating, here's what I want to do. Here's the program I want to do. You know, will I be able to bring this back? So, so that becomes part of that research. Um, somebody asked a really good question about Brexit. And I know this was a huge issue when we were there last year, that was a big question we asked. And at that time, there were no answers. So I'm wondering, and people are wondering, how has Brexit impacted, because uh, it's a pack affected, you know, the cost uh, for other mm -hmm. internet, you know, European um, Union students and such. So do you know what the current status is in terms of um, Brexit on the education in the UK? Yeah, so I'd say from, you know, from, from my side of mostly advising on US students going to the UK, I think um, the, so I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm super familiar, but I would say the biggest impact that I've seen is just a drop in European student applications, which I think UK universities were expecting, um, you know, unfortunately, just with the change um, of European Union students becoming, um, you know, coming into the international student category, and then that correlation with um, higher fees has certainly impacted their um, number of European students from the European Union coming to the UK. Yeah, at least in this, you know, in this, you know, short term, um, moment that we're in still being um, close to, to Brexit, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Latifa, who I, who is, um, she has been adding lots of great comments and I um, appreciate everybody sharing their knowledge yeah. and experience and stuff. So this has been great, but um, she says the Brexit leaves more spaces open for US <laughs> students. And that very well might be true because it puts things on another Footing. So um, let's talk a little bit about the UCAS application. I know you had tried to get somebody from the UCAS, but because yeah. of the time difference and stuff, we weren't able to do that for today. But um, one of the things that we as advisors, they use different terms and the UCAS is set up application process set up a little differently than what we have in the US. So can you share a little bit about that? How, how the, the UCAS application works? Um, and, you know, any other things like we as advisors should be really aware of. Um, I know a couple of things that I've run into and I'm sure many people mm. on our call today can share that. So, um, oh. and Vina says that WACAC is gonna have, oh, yeah. WACAC, which is the Western um, um, Admissions College, uh, you know, it's the regional or version of NACAC, but they're gonna have a college fair this Sunday and there are a number of UK universities presenting, so. Um, That's great. If you, so, Vina, if you have a link to that, stick that in the chat so other people can see that. So, um, but so tell us a little bit about the application process, Jenna. Sure. Um, so, I'll start with saying there are a number of different ways students can apply um, to UK universities. So, um, UCAS is the most um, common route, and I think we advise if students are applying to more than one university in the UK that they do apply through UCAS, um, but some universities do accept um, direct applications um, that would be on their website. And some UK universities are on the Common App as well. So if a student really just wants to apply to one UK institution, then it 
you know, and they see that as a simpler route, then um, they can um, apply it through those routes. But with UCAS, um, we call it, you know, the, the original common app or the truly common app um, for UK institutions because um, every single UK university is on the common app. Um, and we also call them, um, I've heard people reference them like the Lord of the Rings, one ring to the rule them all. UCAS is the one system to rule them all. <laughs> so at UCAS, um, students can um, do their course search. So there's an undergraduate course search function on UCAS where students can, for example, put in different criteria for the course they're looking for, say history, um, if there's any other criteria they're looking for, they can filter with that. And then it will bring up all the courses in the UK that meet that criteria. So there's UCAS course search. Then there's also um, UCAS um, applies. So that's where students will be making their applications. And then there's also UCAS track. So once students submit their applications, they'll be able to track all of their applications and any um, offers through that system. Um, and I guess just to also mention, I guess I should have started with um, UCAS stands for the universities and colleges admissions um, system, I think. Yeah, or service, I think it's system. <laughs> um, so with UCAS, uh, students are allowed um, to apply to up to five uh, courses. Um, typically this would be at five different universities. So this is uh, a big difference. I know um, we're going to talk about some of the differences in the admission system between the US and the UK. And in the UK, students do have to apply to a course, which is what we would call a major, thank you in the comments, yeah, what we would call a major in the US. So students can apply to up to five courses, typically at five different universities. Um, those, uh, the only restrictions that apply, I think with, um, I'm checking my notes, it's medicine, veterinary medicine, and dentistry. Students can only apply up to a maximum of four um, courses in those areas, and then their fifth would need to be in a different area. So most students, for example, would choose like biological sciences for their fifth. Um, the only other restriction is for students thinking about applying to Oxford um, or Cambridge, they will have to choose to apply to one or the other. So they can't apply to both um, universities. Um, there's one simple application cost. I think it's about uh, 24 pounds um, at the moment. Um, so that will cover all five of their applications. Um, and students will have, um, it, they have an invisibility of their choices. So the other um, universities that they apply to through UCAS can't see the other universities that they applied to. So the university just gets the application from the student um, and just sees those details. Um, and then what's included in the application, so there's, you know, sort of a, a standard personal detail section, um, then students will do their subject choices, um, then they will enter their education history um, with their Qualifications is like a word they use a lot in the UK to refer to whatever student has done up to that point to meet the entry requirements. So um, that would include students' courses that they've taken so far and the grade that they achieved, as well as any standardized tests that they've taken so far and the grades that they achieved. They would also list here any um, courses or standardized tests that they expect to take um, but have not taken yet, and they would mark those as pending in their education history. Um, and this is all self-reported at this point. So the UCAS application is completely self-reported by the student um, and universities may get in touch with the student after their application to ask for them to send um, transcripts or um, score reports, but um, the university would be in touch with the student about how to do that separately. Then uh, there's a personal statement, um, which is a quite short piece of work. Um, and I know we're running out of time. I feel like we could do a session on the personal statement is a different, um, a different type of statement than you would typically um, use for a US university. Um, and then there's the reference that would typically be um, coordinated by a counselor in coordination with the students' um, teachers. Um, and then that's where 
uh, counselors would be able to enter any predicted grades, which I know is another big difference uh, between US admissions and UK admissions. So any um, courses um, or standardized tests that the student has put as pending in their education history will show up um, in the reference section for um, the referee to add a predicted score. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to go more into that if people have questions or I know we're um, getting uh, close to the time. So Cindy, if there's other questions um, you want. I think, yeah, so there are just a couple of things, but I wanna point out, you know, so like Julian's asking letter recommendations. Well, in the UCAS, it's not, you're not having recommenders, you're having referees, right? Yes, yeah. And is there a set number of recommendations? Like, do you, is they all just two? Like here on the common app, some schools have two, some have five, oh. you know, you can have different numbers of recommendations depending okay. on the school, so. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just one reference. Um, so the student will put, when they're doing their side of the application, they'll put in, um, yeah, they call it the referee, the referee's email, and then that will send a link to the referee to open up the reference. Um, the reference, I think it's only like 4,000 characters, including spaces. Um, and so what most people will do is the counselor will be the one putting together the reference, but in consultation with a few of the students, teachers, um, typically in the area of where they're applying. So, um, you know, if they're applying to like a, a science subject, they'll try to talk to their maybe math and science teachers to get uh, feedback from the teachers. And um, UK universities always tell me they do encourage um, counselors to include a link to the school profile within the reference, um, just because our education system does vary so much um, across the US um, that it helps them to see um, more information about the school profile. And if the counselor can provide any information about um, you know, the rigorousness of the courses that the student has chosen to take, um, if there, excuse me, is um, any additional information that, um, that a, counselor thinks, you know, they need to qualify students' application with that can be put in the reference. So it sounds like the reference, the one reference should be the counselor, the school counselor from the, the student, right? That's, tip, that's typical, yeah. That's typically recommended by UCAS. Okay. And so then going back to the predicted grades, because people are asking, you know, who is yeah. putting those in? And, yeah. and I, I will mention that, and I'll put this in the show notes. I did an interview with University of Manchester, um, oh, yeah. two representatives, um, Daniel and... Um, Maybe Shane or really Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I'll put those in the show notes because that's a huge question that yeah. school counselors have and we as independents have too. It's like, well, what's a predicted grade? So can you explain that just a little bit more? Um, you know, we're talking about, a, you know, the tests and things that UK students have. Typically, they go through A-levels, right? Um, and so explain a little bit what you mean when you say predicting, yeah. what does that mean? Sure. And yeah, I'm sure the interview you have, Cindy, will yeah, offer yeah, a much more wealth of information on that topic. Um, so from how it's been you know, explained to me from UCAS and from the universities is that um, you know, predicted grades from the counselor, it should just be you know, a best guess um, and how how you feel and based on their past performance and how you feel a student would um, perform on their best day. Um, so those are the guidance they've given. And it's, you know, a way for, since um, the UK also has this for um, their domestic students, it's just their admission system is a, a pre, they call it pre-qualifications admission system. So before all the qualifications are in, um, they will be making students those offers. So it's just for the universities to be able to get an idea of where the counselor thinks the student is going to land in their final semester courses, um, as well as any pending um, standardized tests. Um, but I, I do know it, it's very unusual to, um, 
for us in the U.S. to ask for that. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sure the, the further guidance in the interview will be super useful as well. But that, that's how it's been um, explained to me from UCAS and the universities. And I saw someone asking where the um, predicted grades would be um, entered into the reference. Um, and so it should be within the reference section, any classes or um, standard, standardized tests that a student has marked as pending should show up in the reference um, section for the counselor to be able to put in the predicted grades. And I think, you know, and, and from this conversation that I had previously, you know, sometimes counselors are very hesitant and, and they're very yeah. conservative in their grades. And one of the messages that um, the representatives had was don't be conservative, you know, be um, optimistic in what you put because they can always come back and get the exact grades. But if you put mm -hmm. low predicted grades, that can kick a student out and, and then they can't come back and do something. So it's better to be generous and then have that, that grade level than to be real conservative and then the student doesn't get a second chance. So um, so what's your email address? Jenna? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to share and please do get in touch with any questions. Um, so my email address is, um, so it's my name, which I guess is on the Zoom profile. It's Jenna, um, J-E-N-N-A dot Hartzell, H-A-R-T-S-E-L-L -L, at British Council, all one word, um, dot org. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have, again, if you'd like me to put you in touch with any UK university representatives, um, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and if I don't know the answer to your question, I'll try to get in touch with someone who, who can um, answer. And thank you. We, that is greatly appreciated. And, and that's where you're, um, as a resource for us as counselors and advisors, it's so valuable because we often don't know who to go to. And so being able to have you funnel us through is really definite. Um, people are asking, is this recorded? Yes, I've recorded this and we will make it available on our website. I've also will publish this as a podcast so that people can listen to this and um, go over it. So um, just we, we, you guys have all put in a lot of great questions. I'm gonna send these to Jenna. We didn't really get time. There's just so know. many things to cover. I think we can do a session, right? Yes, yeah, we Let's can do, do a part a, two. A yeah. No, Definitely. no, so we may have to, um, you know, consider a part two, but, um, any, before we close, any words of advice, what, what would you tell us as um, advisors, you know, and we're working with international students, what, what words of advice would you give us? Yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, I've already talked about this, so it's maybe beating the same drum, but um, just to really develop um, those relationships with the UK university representatives where you can. Um, I've found them to be incredible resources of information. And um, I think um, from my experience, some, you know, sometimes talking with students or parents, they can be nervous to reach out to the rep because um, you know, I'm honestly not sure if it's maybe they think the questions they're asking might impact on like an admissions decision. I'm not sure, but um, it really doesn't. The reps um, are there just to be helpful, to help guide counselors, students, and parents through this process. And um, they're a really collaborative um, sector. So they're happy to answer questions about studying in the UK generally, not just about their university. So if you have general questions, they're happy to answer those too. So um, I really do encourage fostering those relationships. And then I guess kind of a message for students um, that um, I often try to get across is to maybe think outside what you originally um, think of where you want to go in the UK. So I think most students immediately think of, you know, of course, the places they know, like London um, and maybe some uh, universities that are more familiar to us here in the US, but they're really, there's a wealth of different universities in the UK, just like here in the US and all types of locations um, that have a lot to offer for US students. So I think just 
trying to be open-minded during the process um, of looking in the UK. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think more and more we're being able to offer that. So Jenna, thank you so much. You can see in the chat, everybody is very, um, has excited and really enjoyed this. There are some questions. If you have a question that was in the chat, please put it in the question answer because I will send that to, to you, um, you know, some specifics about UCAS and stuff. So we want to be able to address those. Um, I want to let everybody know the next time we're going to be meeting is going to be in two weeks. My Friday forums are every two weeks. And starting in April, I'm going to try and do them the first Friday and the third Friday. So we'll have some variation, but, but look, watch your schedules for that. And our next session, we're actually going to have Gina Lester, and she's going to talk about taking her business online and how she really increased her business in the past uh, year. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Jenna, especially for your time. And this has just been very enlightening and just it's always fun to talk to you. So um, and watch your emails for for more information. And we'll, you know, take care and have a good weekend, everyone. Jenna, you too. And um, thanks, Cindy. <laughs> so all right, well, this ends our webinar for today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.